Welcome everyone to another Friends from the Field webinar. As I mentioned before, as people were joining, if you would like to put your name and where you're from and why you're interested in this topic tonight in the chat box, please feel free to do so. We love to see who's joining us this evening. If you're new to this series, um, we host webinars pretty much every Thursday um, and we've been doing this for the past year. And this series is co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, which is a community conservation organization for Blue Hill and um, the Blue Hill Peninsula and Island Heritage Trust, which is a land trust for Deer Isle, Stonington and surrounding islands. Uh, my name is Lander and I'm the outreach coordinator for Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And we have Jake here with us from Island Heritage Trust, who's my counterpart over there. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to him for some technology housekeeping and then I will introduce um, Anne. Thank you so much, Lander. And thanks everybody for joining us. We've got 43 of you tuned in and we're so excited to be here. Um, this afternoon, we're going to use predominantly just two features. We're going to use the chat feature, which many of you are already using. So thanks for letting us know where you're viewing from. We're so excited. You can ask questions in the chat um, panel throughout the presentation. Feel free to do so. We will save our questions for Anne for the end, uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes in the end, we'll ask some questions. And if you're feeling up to it, we'd love to have some of you use the raise your hand feature. And that is in the center bottom panel to the right, you'll see a little hand that says raise your hand. And you can click that and Lander will give you the option to ask Anne your question with your own audio, which is always nice because it's great to hear people's voices and, and let them tune in themselves. And if there's any other questions, please drop them in the chat box and we're happy to help you out. Other than that, I'm going to hand it back over to Lander and we're going to do our formal introduction. Thanks so much, Jake. So I am so excited to introduce um, Anne Fluelling. She is a psychologist, a photographer, a gardener, a land steward, among many other things. And she is here to talk with us today um, about many different things. She and her husband, Charles Reed, bought a farm in 1996 along the Bagaduce River that they named Farview Farm. And, and she's going to tell us lots of stories about how their, her time there has evolved over the years. So Anne, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We're really excited to have you. And I will pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Lander. I'm very happy to be here and happy to have so many people watching. Uh, I'll get started with this whenever you would like us to start me to start it. You can go ahead. So, okay. Uh, I can't see my, can't see my notes, Jake. My notes have disappeared. It, it looks like Jake hopped off his screen to come and help you, Anne. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're in different rooms together. <laughs> and meanwhile, everyone, you could check out the chat box. We have a lot of people sharing who they are and where they're from, which is really fun to see. Oh, we have somebody from Florida. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, we're ready to go. You are probably viewing the first slide right now that says the beautiful Bag of the Big Vaduce River. It's taken from the north point of our piece of property. The Wabanaki peoples call this river the Maja Big Vaduce, the beautiful river in the sense that it possessed navigational attributes, I suspect, that were attractive to them uh, not beautiful in the usual sense of the world word, but practical and utilitarian, I would imagine. I favor this Wabanaki name for the river over the abbreviated Bagadus name that we use today, eclipsing as it seems to do the indigenous people's full presence in Maine history. However, in daily use, the common name Bagadus seems to have won the popularity contest for now. After all, the names of other of Maine's rivers, uh, natively named rivers, seem to have survived better. For example, the six syllabled Mooseluk Maguntakuk, five syllables in Passamaquoddy, four syllables in, in Piscataquis, three in Penobscot, 
and so many more remain more or less intact. So I take the liberty of declaring its real name right here on the front of this screen page, as well as on the next. Next. Beginning in the lower left of the screen of this Google Earth picture taken rather recently, uh, follow the river from Castine Harbor on the lower left, all the way up to Northern Bay, and then back, back southeast to Northern Bay that still shows toward the mid top of the screen. And then beyond through the Penobscot, uh, the color fades out as you angle on down to the southeast. And at the very end, you will see uh, a darker body of water that will lead you through Brooksville and Sedgwick and Fani to our Snow's Cove. It's a little tiny polyp that you will see later uh, that make it into a peninsula. Now let's launch our canoes for a virtual journey along the modern day Bagadoose River while remembering that once it had a more historical, beautiful name. Next. Is there sound, Jake? Jake, the sound's not on. Hang tight, everyone. We're just gonna troubleshoot the audio and then we'll, we'll continue.
The setting is the scenic Bagadus, short for Majibigwadus, the big Tideway River, a scenic tidal estuary flowing into Penobscot Bay. From our home on a small 12 acre peninsula, I explore by foot and by kayak, camera my constant companion. Here the tides and current are modest, the upriver water brackish, our east shore hugs Snow Cove, the evergreen and deciduous woodlands protecting the calm of Quiet Cove, as we call it, with its eelgrass meadows, marine nurseries, timeless homestead of horseshoe crabs, and convenient dining for the great blue heron. On the west shore, the fifth narrows, is a constricted rock-strewn passage with a broad blueberry barren on opposite bank. The flat water of Judy Rapids, as the Fifth Narrows is locally known, barely betrays mild turbulence beneath its surface at flood and ebb tides. Pygmy alewives slip through here on their way to Walker Pond spawning grounds while overhead, bald eagles glide to alight in tall spruce. The river in winter is more or less frozen in place, except for a channel of open water gracefully curving through the narrows. All of Snow Cove and the Farview Down River is a white scape punctuated by small seasonal cubes of ice fishing shacks. On weekends, bundled figures scurry up and down the frozen river like human commas or small smelt. Some winter nights, the river groans, long, deep, reverberating tidal moans. The great river wails, one of us predictably wails with knowing glance, the other groaning. South, down at the narrow neck of land, a near sea level stem connects us to the rest of the landed planet. Here, river otters, those shy pups who year round grace us with playful surprise, body slide from shore to shore, disappearing into the culvert and out again on the other side, leaving their trail perpendicular to our snow plowed drive. Tracking the signs, I muse over the metaphor. April melt and heavy rain will sometimes reduce this low neck to near causeway status. The soaked watershed runoff backlogged, bottlenecked at the reversing falls between here and the bay. And our little peninsula's north point once again has its far blue view of river twisting out of sight through four more narrows before reaching the Penobscot River and Bay. Each spring, right on signal with the first bloom of shed blow, osprey return overhead, bright chevrons heralding.
There is something about Mount Katahdin, a desire for primal connection to the wildscape that draws us to this place, along with all the other travelers who pull off I-95 to check out the overlook. People are always taking pictures and posing in the view to have their picture taken, proving I have been here in this place with its glistening lake filled by watershed of the Great Spirit Mountain. Years ago, my father painted a headdress chieftain profile on the left side of the bow of his 20 foot Old Town Guide canoe and an Indian princess with feathered headband on the right. Symbols for he and my mother traveling together. This Thanksgiving, I showed my elderly father an online video, a Gwyden building a birch bark canoe, which I'd discovered in the process of building this book. A Gwyden is the Penobscot name, floats lightly for the birch bark canoe. In 2005, Chief Barry Dana hired Steve Kayard, a white man, to show tribal members how to regain their lost art of a Gwydon building. One hour of moving moments from birch bark harvest all the way to launch, captured in a digital video, ending with Elder placing feathers onto the bow, tribal members lifting the light of Gwydon into the Penobscot. In one graceful motion, Barefoot Chief steps in and kneels, dipping ash paddle in the sacred river and glides into the big quiet of water. Beside me came soft murmur of my father's voice, full of reverence and delight. Oh, that is so beautiful. I folded my hands to silent lips, smiling and weeping. During the seasons of open water, I listen in the big quiet for ancestral sounds, murmur of indigenous people paddling a Gwydon all the way down from Northern Maine's Aroostook River, a short carry to connecting waterways to the Penobscot, then paddling right past this little peninsula on the Bagadoos, en route to Walker Pond, then a carry to the punch bowl of Agamogan Reach and off to Deer Isle or up the Benjamin River to Salt Pond and further on to Blue Hill Bay. Or maybe just as we are, pausing right here to make camp for a season.
That was so beautiful, Anne. Thank you for that. Are you moving on to a greening your watershed landscape next? Yes, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, Jake is getting ready. Cool. And then we can take questions on um, both of these uh, mini presentations toward the end. Okay. And that was such a peaceful treat already. And Thank I'm, you. I'm so looking forward to the next part. And you could close my face out now if you'd like to. I'd be happy to help you with that. Okay. Um, just get this queued up for us and then we're ready to go, okay? Thanks, Jake. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. I'm very impressed by technology these days, what we're able to, what we're able to do. Absolutely. Okay, so I've got this up. And Anne, there's no videos in this presentation, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, all right, I just, I wanted to make sure because it's it's coming up format wise, just a wee bit different. And I just wanted to make sure that I had okay. everything that I was supposed to. So I'm gonna share my screen again and we can get on to the next presentation. Okay. Welcome, and thank you for joining me on the shore of Snow's Cove, where we live. You are looking east to the south and lowest area of our landscape, an area we call the Neck. With an active otter trail crossing the cove to the west side of this small 12-acre peninsula in the huge Bagaduce, Magibigbaduce watershed. And next. Consider the familiar areas of Down East Maine that have roles, large and small, in how and where the water sheds. Perhaps Surrey's Carrying Place Beach on Newberry Neck facing Acadia's Cadillac Mountain. Next. Or this place from its perspective on Blue Hill Bay from Parker Point Road. You'll notice Blue Hill Mountain to the left in the landscape. Next. This roadside marsh on the route of 176 North and Cedric plays its own little ro local role. Next. Likewise, Walker Pond in Brooksville, here in the foreground, the Beaver Dam. Walker Pond is a significant Bagaduce River tributary. Next. Deer Isle Billings Cove in Sunshine certainly has liquid connections to the big Atlantic Ocean watershed. Oceanville is in the distance. Next. Of course, Pierce's Pond in Penobscot is faithful in its Bagaduce watershedding role, while also assisting alewives up this fine fishway conceived and supported by Blue Hill Heritage Trust. Next. This cunning kind of place in Cape Rogers Weir Cove on the left is bound to be glimpsed in, by, with curious admiration by passers-by. Behind is Stan Cove looking south toward Deer Isle, another spot in the down east Atlantic watershed. Next. Or this, Cross Lake, our family camp shore, just one of six lakes in northern Maine's Fish River chain of lakes shown here in one of its, some of its many moods. Next. And next. And next. And next. 
Now we were right back here on the Bagadoos, north, downriver from our little peninsula. To us, it looks like a lake, except for our awareness of a modest 17-inch tide. Next. Our property is located on the east side of this peninsula's center lane. So if you look up into what we call the polyp uh, at the end, which is divided in half by a roadway, we have 1,284 feet of beautiful shoreline, plus a view of Blue Hill Heritage Trust Snows Cove Preserve, as well as views down river. And to the right of our polyp point uh, is part of Snows Cove. And of course, is now the Blue Hill Heritage Trust Preserve. Next. Stony Brook, Snows Brook, early on was known as Stave Cove, and it was the site of a timber harvesting uh, for barrel staves, presumably oak. The entrepreneur was Joshua Sto Snow, who came from Toro, Massachusetts, to the Sedgwick area. He purchased land and three mills on Frost Creek, which is today known as Stony Brook or Snows Brook. One mill was 250 feet east of the current main route 15, another next to the east side of the road and a third on the west side of the road. The X's illustrate my best guesses uh, of where those were. Joshua was uh, originally from uh, Halifax. He had been a veteran of the French and Indian War. So it is my hunch that he was a loyalist. And although many loyalists after the close of the Revolutionary War returned to Canada, being unwelcomed here, uh, areas surrounding the Castine and Penobscot River did have many loyalists. I'd like to thank Lita Bay Gray at the Blue Hill Library for her research assistance on this particular topic. Next. River, the river, this is just the river in the Sedgwick area that starts up by the uh, Brooksville Reversing Falls uh, to Walker Pond. You can see the head of Walker Pond down at the bottom left side of the screen. If you were to access this map for a close up view, you would find many family names that are probably still familiar to folks who live here locally. And it is available online. Next. Now back to today's cove. Our east side property on Snow's Cove boasts of a growing community of more than 280 northern red oaks. I didn't even count the small ones. And I'll also mention that even though the oaks, as they've been cut in the past, uh, have you know one, two, three, four, five, and sometimes six or more trunks, I only counted that as one. So with all of our oaks ranging from one to many trunks, 280. I was astounded. I didn't count the small ones. I tended to count things that I could see, could see or that were one inch or larger. Oaks provide greater ecological benefit than any other species in the Northern Hemisphere. This information from Doug Tallamy, who we'll mention shortly. Next. Paddle north around the shore. Uh, to the north point, swing toward the south to the Fifth Narrows, which you're starting to see with the uh, boulders. It's also called Judy Rapids, and it's not very rapid at all. This is overall a peaceful place. Next. Peaceful it is. And next. And next. This is a working blueberry barren uh, on that other side of the Fifth Rapids. We see blueberry work and uh, going on every summer around July. Next. This is a view from our peninsula lot to Snow's Cove Preserve. 
About a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, I wish, about 10 years ago, we received a brochure in our mail from Blue Hill Heritage Trust. On the front page was an aerial view of a new preserve they had acquired on the Bagadus. We studied and studied the photo to figure out where this could possibly be. The only clue was a single residence on the opposite shore. It was our house. The last we had known was that the shore of Snow's Cove had been planned for a subdivision. Oh, what a wonderful surprise that was to us. Next. I'm just going to show you several uh, views of that wonderful Snow's Cove preserve to the east of us. Next. And next. Next. It happens that our very best sunset views are in the east, and you can see why. The sun setting from the west on the other side of this little peninsula shows through our trees onto Blue Hill Heritage Trust Preserve in its golden glow. Next. Oops. This is the shore of the cove in autumn. There are a couple of uh, uh, homes on properties there and at the very end, it turns and becomes Blue Hill Heritage Trust property. Next. These are just a few more scenes this winter. Next. This is Snow's Cove in white winter, viewed from our neck, right near the Otter's Trail, very near the Otter's Trail. Next. Evening's full moonlight over Snow's Cove. Next. And some autumn morning joy. Next. This is a great shoreline covered long ledge that we called Picnic Rock because it was so fun to sit on and have a picnic when we first got on the property. Next. And northeast in the evening as sun is setting. Next. And next. Now we're going on a trip back through time from 2021 back to 1996, uh, a year after we purchased the property. Next. In 1997, 1995 actually, we purchased this property on our first wedding anniversary. Oh, that was 1996. That's forgetting my anniversary uh, in July in 1996. On June 1999, we returned to Maine to begin building our own design of a New England Greek revival farmhouse, the big house, little house, barn style architecture on our dream place. The pond will be something that you will see over and over, so that will help locate you. We're looking north in this uh, and the whole southern part of our property, which is all Long Meadow, et cetera, all the way back down to the what we call the neck and the otter thing is not in this photo. But in the next photo, you will see a Google Earth image burr from March 2004, looks like mud season almost, except the river is certainly, uh, Snow Cove is, certainly has not had ice out. Next. Now you will find us on our property, doing the business of clearing shrub and growing lawn, the advent of Fireview Farms' fab fabulous riding lawnmower.
And we can see what it will do next. Look at that. It can really mow. That's our pond in the background. There are, other than the uh, evergreen on the far left, there's a very tiny tree, you know, a yellowish looking tree, which is a willow. Uh, I'll mention that shortly. The second one is a, uh, which will show this come up lately, uh, is a linden tree. And the last one uh, is a, uh, oh, red maple. I stutter on that one because there's a problem with that. Okay, next. And more lawn. Next. And the lawn is still growing larger. If you look right to the upper uh, middle and see just a bushy looking tree over by the pond to the right of that little blue uh, seat. That is an embarrassment. Uh, that is a Japanese willow, which I will mention again later. I'll just mention it now. We went to a Bangor uh, flower show early on in our uh, time here, and they were selling these quirky, curvy, interesting looking willow sticks and said, if you can take them home and put them in the ground and the water, it'll grow to become a great big willow. So we got a couple and planted them in the pond. They grew to massive sizes. I think they'll show up again later. And as they grew in their quirky, strange, circular and grooved kind of position, I started noticing that same feature uh, starting on also a meadow sweet branch not far away. And then sometime later, I found that on a black eyed Susan stem. So we canned the tree. <laughs> uh, I think it's better not to get uh, Japanese willows. Next. So the lawn's still growing more. We managed to get it up to the whole side on the river. And if you go to next, you'll see that we spread it across the north part side of our property. Uh, that's a little too far ahead, but that's okay. We've got, that may have gotten changed. Uh, in the backyard, we missed the backyard there, but just know that there's more. <laughs> so on this one, fire view is complete. Now, where did this landscape ethic come from? Next. First notice in the um, one third from the right in the wooded areas past this field, a tiny white steeple. That is the steeple of the church in our little village. My father helped erect that steeple. This is along the Aroostook River. It's in Crowsville, Maine. So this is where we lived. Our house was only across the road and across from the steeple was the, the school. And next to the school was our house to the left. And next to our house was the, the town village store. So that was the center of town. The Aroostook River is beyond that. And on the other side is Mapleton. This is, you know, one reason why uh, to people, a lot of green can look good. First of all, these great lawns, yes, came from England. They were really big on huge ostentatious lawns and et cetera. But also I think later by promotions from grass seed and lawn maintenance producers maybe, but in my particular formative childhood, growing up in a rustic with its rich soil, producing fine crops of potatoes and oats, this looked beautiful for it meant rural livelihoods and prosperity. My father at 16 began working with his uncle at Crows, Crowsville, learned the business, ultimately became one, among the earliest board of directors 
uh, members of the board of directors of the Maine Potato Growers and the longest serving member. He was shipping certified seed from Crossville to Greenland to Florida and on. And next. Also, my mother's father on the Mapleton side of the river. His father, his great grandfather, settled there in 1894 from New Brunswick. Now, this is how you raise and feed a family. You clear and farm the land, plant potatoes and oats, have a milk cow and chickens, maybe pigs too, and you can feed and raise your family. Don't forget to erect a windmill in the apple orchard for a water supply to the house and barn. In the background behind the uh, wooded area just in front of the mountain, uh, mountains uh, or hills, excuse me, uh, is a Presque Isle stream, a branch of it. Now next. Okay, this is June 21st, the longest day in the world around 2003. Our large lawn was in the works. The existing pond was silting up with cattails because by this time, that pond that had been dug quite a number of years ago uh, because the uh, developer's bulldozer sunk in it. <laughs> it didn't know it was a pond until they lost the bulldozer and digging the bulldozer out, they found that that area was uh, slated to be a pond and it is today. So by the time we were there, there were a few shrubs and planted. And two of the things that we planted around there were two uh, willow trees, good, good news. Will willows are good trees, that kind of tree. These are the, the uh, willow uh, that we have in Maine. Each of them was $10.33. How the local uh, nursery who is no longer in business uh, <laughs> sold them for that, I don't know. There's also a bare root linden that I got from Walmart, of all things, that little tiny one that's behind uh, to the left of the reddish looking one. And of course that Norway maple cult cultivar that we put in for color. Oh, and notice the three Rugosa rose shrubs as a nice starter hedge. Well, next. Here's why. And so as you put things on your own lawns, particularly if people can see, uh, bear this lesson in mind, that people tend to see something pretty and say, oh, I want one. But that's what we did. Driving around Blue Hill and Deer Isle Peninsulas, we had admired the beautiful mounds of vigorously growing roses, Rugosa roses to be exact. To be exact. They must be native, they're growing here. This and other fashionable shrubs crept into our lives and lawn from local garden centers. Barberry, burning bush, Morrow's honeysuckle. Is it native, we'd ask a salesperson? Oh yes, people here love it. That was the reply. Must be native if natives love it. Well, today we have succeeded in removing all of the above except this. This now, those three little tiny shrubs, 30 by 10 feet by six feet tall mound is a Japanese beetle magnet. They simultaneously feed and copulate. It's a blooming summer orgy when the roses bloom and their little bugger grubs thrive in the lawn. We cut this thing to the ground this spring. That's hard to do, it's just very briary. But still the rugged Rugosa roots stay two and a half feet deep, solidly intertwined together and will spread and continue to spread until the excavator comes whenever. We refuse to use Roundup or glyphosate which we understand is the only other option. If anyone knows of another option, let me know. But uh, I think the excavator is gonna be our salvation. Next. Oh, beautiful, aren't they? Pollinators wanted, highly desirable working conditions, free meals provided plus family benefits. And the Japanese beetles are eager hires. I must clarify, however, that we have had a huge reduction in beetles since removing the lawn space and keeping only lanes and walking paths. 
but we'll get to that shortly. And next. Oh, sweet, honey. No, no longer to us. It's not. Next. Now serving Japanese beetle soup, naturally grown, freshly harvested daily all summer long from this healthy Japanese beetle farm, fed only by the most robust rugoses. Next. Still like it? Oh, how we regret this move. Next. So that was the beginning of the end of our huge lawn farm and the reduction in lawnmower bee killing. 70% of all beneficial bees nest in the ground. We began reducing mowing, decreasing lawn area and increasing pollinator garden beds and wild meadow areas. We also only uh, mow our paths when we need to mow them. Uh, at toward the end of the day when the bees with ground bees have settled down uh, or at other times of the year and not when a lot is flowering. So next. Then came to Blue Hill on June 31st in 2016, a speaker entomologist, Douglas Tallamy, hosted by, among others, Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Island Her Heritage Trust with Tallamy's revolutionary message, bringing nature home. His work and that of other like-minded ecologists is a godsend to the planet, if only we will all pay attention. Next. Previously, the Japanese beetles had been eating not only rugosa petals and leaves, but also our cherished linden tree and conquered grapevines and more. As our lawn shrunk, the Japanese beetles decreased dramatically because their grubs loved to be in lawn and we got rid of lawn. That this is a black and white picture, which is not too unlike another one that you may see later. I'm not sure. Next. Now, doesn't this look a lot better? You can see where the willow tree is. It's no longer on the lawn. This is a whole, we extended our lower meadow far, far, far. Next. planting pollinator gardens several years ago. I think we started around 2016. Blue Hill horticulturist Val Libby put me onto a source prairie moon nursery for deep rooted prairie pollinator plugs. Rather than planting a seed, you can have a plug already planted and that could get you going like a year in advance. So I planted this one in the front. You'll see that on the left. You can see the meadow creeping up toward it right there with the uh, lupins in them. Since then, I've created two more plots with prairie moon plugs. Then after that, I ventured on my own and made my own plugs, but we will go next. The first and third pollinator gardens are here. So you can see how I snug them closely together. And in the background is another one, a meadow that I already, I mean, a garden I already had. Here's how I plant on top of a former lawn. I use Gempler's heavyweight bi biodegradable mulch paper in rolls of various widths. I've used four inch wide rolls topped with four to five inches of fresh loam and then planted the plugs. Now I harvest my own seed by planting the seed in potting soil filled toilet fissure, tissue tubes that I've collected over the time. There's use for them. I stand the tubes up in a snug in a container, like a plastic window planter or some such. It needs to be able to drain. Fill it with soil or the soil or planting soil, four inches or so. Add two or three seeds to the top. Cover them with thin sprinkles of sand. I generally do this in December and then leave them out all winter in the weather until spring. This is important because many of the Pollinator seeds need to have at least three or six or even more uh, time in the winter to uh, be able to grow in the spring. Also, some mesh screen on the top is recommended because rodents like to uh, get into these things. 
So after the cotyledon stage in the spring, you thin them as needed, and then you allow several sets of leaves to develop on the seedling while it's still sitting in the toilet paper root. Uh, the roots should be getting nice and deep thin. Depending on the species growth, I plant the plugs in garden plots from late June to, to late July. The cardboard tubes tend to deteriorate, so I generally leave the seedling right in the tube to avoid disturbing the fragile root system, although that's not necessary if you're careful. Next. The new gardens are surrounded just by lanes. You can see this lane that takes us down around and ultimately to the pond. We just mow whatever green vegetation is there. We don't care what it is. Dandelions and clover are invited and whatever else happens to just be green and gets mowed. The plot underneath that Norway maple cultivar was planted with homemade plugs, not the cultivar. <laughs> the plant, the, that around it was the first one I'd done on my homemade plugs. The chainsaw has since seen to it that this unwelcome non-native tree disappeared from our property. I'm glad to report. And next. This is okay, the fourth garden. That's the fourth garden. And again, the North, the Norway is not there. Next. Now let's do a tribute to a few of our pollinators. These are on some pussy willows uh, down by the pond where it's nice and wet. Next. Quaker Lady Bluets. Next. Marshmallow by the pond. Next. Dwarf Crested Iris imported by us from our former mountain home in North Georgia. They're now living on the edge of our North Point woodlands. Next. I've watched these ladies grow for many years, and now there are four. They're on our east shore in the woodlands under the oaks. Next. Small moth on the sheep laurel. I think you'll have to see the sheep laurel and find that small moth on it. It's sort of rusty colored. And a cosmos clump in the garden. Next. White admiral butterfly and a bumblebee is lower than it is on an ass hyssop. And then the right image as the Joe Pie didn't make it in the picture. Blazing star, some early goldenrod that didn't quite make it in the picture. Uh, cardinal flower, and looks like uh, black eyed Susans. Next. Here the white admiral displays its colors. Next. And we're kind of working around our houses if we're in the yard that we've been in the front yard more. Now we're kind of working around counterclockwise onto the, to the east of our house. This is volunteer sweet fern and our oaken wooded edge. I've been able to keep uh, dog bane out of it, which the dog bane will tend to be more um, aggressive than the sweet fern. So I tend to give it a pull out just to enjoy the sweet fern. Next. And this is juniper that naturally volunteered by that granite, a granite ledge. A couple of chairs that my brother Dick Flewelling made for us at our wedding. Next. Cinnamon ferns thrive in this spot along our pond shore and other places on our property. Next. The former East Lawn bordering the shoreline uh, woodland with where the red oak and pine and spruce are. There's a variety of ferns, a young moosewood, or also called uh, striped maple on the left. You can see that far left. In the foreground on the left, a new shad bush, a homemade bird bath there, it's brown looking, and other newly started pollinator parts. Uh, Plots, there are two kind of new ones started there. 
and other shrubs introduced in the background. That Japanese maple in the background will be exhumed next week along with all other earlier exotic plants. There are two more up at North Point that are going to get gone. Next. This is the planted drainage ditch north of our house in order to just deal with our house and the sloping lawn, uh, a drainage ditch, just surface drainage ditch uh, helped drain that so that we didn't have ice going into our back door. Uh, and the drainage ditch is right there. We'll see next in the next slide, a lovely image, I think. These are rustic fiddlehead ferns that of course we transported down from Heroistic, Maine, have all of our over our property and a wonderful place for them is in the drainage ditch, of course. They thrive there. And this Zen sculpture meditates in the dappled shade. Next. These are some Solomon, Solomon seal in our damp and shaded back, uh, backyard garden. Next. Here, south of our pond, it's wooded again with a number of conifers. Uh, there's a viburnum. Uh, then next, the big fluffy one is a hemlock. Uh, the large one on the far right is a Douglas fir. Don't ask me why. <laughs> it's now 40 feet tall. Uh, Douglas fir didn't exactly, is not exactly a main tree, but it's certainly growing here. Um, it, we, decided for other reasons in 2003 and 4 before we knew better to do that. Uh, and of course, there's the Catawba rhododendron there. Next. Oh, oh no, not next, sorry. Well, that's all right. You saw our, uh, uh, what we call a Zen pavilion that we uh, put over where our vegetable garden had been. And I'll go down here. This is the second planted pollinator garden. Uh, oh, this is our former vegetable garden. It became a Zen pavilion, we call it, surrounded by a meadow. And two pollinator gardens are on the front side, the front south side. Here you go. So it's a backyard extension of the meadow. The next, there you go. And next, now behind all of this is another, what we call the North Meadow, just before North Point. And that has some yellow lupin added to it because our uh, purple blue lupins were so uh, prominent that I just thought I would introduce another color. They also, lupins have long tap roots which help break up our compacted clay soil and also provide nit nitrogen fixing bacteria. So that's certainly an advantage. Next. Something's happening, not happening. You may need to come over. Jake, my uh, screen is not going down. Excuse us for a moment, technical. This, I must have hit this wrong. So just. Uh, Okay. Am I unmuted now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. This is our uh, bird cafeteria. Uh, these have all fruiting uh, plants in it, uh, elderberry, um, grapes, vineyard in the back that you can't see. Uh, roses, etc. not rugoses. Next. This is the cottage my husband and I built in 2007 at North Point with rhododendrons. Here's the cottage again, the natural spruce. 
This is uh, our North Point uh, meadow. It's in front of that little cottage. Another pollinator garden. And these are some uh, bugs. There's the white marked tuthic moss. Oh, I think you need to uh, take me forward. I left you, I'm sorry. One more, and then one more. Okay, now we're up to date. Sorry, Jake. And there are zomonic, there are monarch caterpillars next. Woolly moth snuggled on a waning monarch seed head. And some more bugs. I won't bother to name them for you right now. We'll move on. So those are the bugs. Let's move on. Okay. This is a pearl crescent. That was a pearl crescent uh, on a St. John's shrub wart, a wart sub John St. John's wart shrub. Now, where is goldenrod in our meadow? Next. And next, this is the catalpa tree today. It's thrived well. Next, it's a good place for a Zen bench. We built a number of them many years ago. And next, last fall was the third year for spring mowing to maintain the meadows every three years. So this, you'll see some of this. We left the high meadow, so we would still have things for the birds and creatures up toward the hoe. And that's mowable in the springtime. Next. This is winterberry, more bird food. It's down near our, what we call swamp. Next. High wish cranberry originally from Fedco Bear Roots in the 20s, uh, 2000s, let me excuse me. Next, more highbush cranberry and next. Now this is the neck. This is our walking path separated from the otter trail. And down at the neck, next you will see the rare loveliness of wild Redora, which Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, beauty is its own excuse for being. It blooms each spring in our next swamp bog. Next. And next. This is a wonderful meadow uh, up front where you see more of the red. That's uh, a lot of that is uh, blueberries. And we also have a lot of uh, meadow spirea, sweet fern, uh, black and red choke, ch chokeberry. We, have, we planted the tamarack hackmatack large. I like hackmatack for the name, but it's a very wet area and things do nicely. Next. So again, the only thing I want to say in this slide and I'm gonna skip after that is over toward the barn, but looking right next to the pond is again, that Japanese willow uh, that we got rid of, don't do it. Next. This is our pond two years ago. We had it uh, redone so it would live with us a little longer. Um, that dinghy went to a IHT auction and sold for $500 after a IHT member refurbished it. Next. So we have amphibians and unknown fishes in our pond. The uh, osprey come at, are overhead all the time, the eagle and a uh, great blue heron on whose territory we obviously trespassed when we bought the property comes frequently to the pond to uh, eat a snack. Next, to pond rhododendron, next. And I'll show you our pond, Rodora. This is our dog, Rodora Good Girl, and she's moseying about her paradise. Next, around the ponds are some philopendula. Next is another philopendula. And next is our turnaround with a bunch of local Osmonda interruptus fern clumps along with orange turf cat 
Turk, Turk cat lilies, natural Queen Anne's lace volunteers. They volunteer without being asked. And of course, some lilies from a neighbor. Next, speaking of lilies, wood lilies, once seen frequently in wood and blueberry barrens, are now becoming rare with the increase in modernized techniques for blueberry harvesting. We manage our meadows to avoid damaging and have had counts of up to 30 and 40 wood lilies in our meadows every year, except for the last year's severe summer drought. In the past, I've shared wood, wood lily seed pods with Wild Maine's, Maine, uh, Maine's Wild Seed Project. Uh, but we are one of the only properties because people mow way too soon that we currently see uh, wood lilies on in our neighborhood. Next. Some more flowers, I won't bother to name them. You can recognize them. They're native. Next, the Jerusalem artichoke. Next, a nice one because this is a swallowtail on Monarda. And next, this is a red digger wasp on a blue globe, globe thistles. These wasps are our friends and I have not found them to be aggressive either. I get really close to them. Next. Sneezeweed, fall sneezeweed is named that because it's used to be dried to make stuff to cause a person to sneeze away evil spirits. Actually, the fresh sneezeweed blossom does not cause sneezing at all. Regardless, there've been no evil spirits in our garden either. Next. It's a brown hooded owlet car caterpillar, one of our friends. Next. Monarch caterpillar and its own chrysalis getting ready to hatch on the right. I love that because it's only a few hours before hatching. You can see the pattern of the wing in the chrysalis. Next. If you want a meadow, perhaps this will work just as well to stop mowing it and letting the ground grow what's there. As you know, before you know, my late father, optimistic farmer said to me once as we ventured behind our Cross Lake camp in Northern Maine on a land leased by the Irving Timber Company to one of its timber area covered swamps where moose, moose traps, tracks, timber debris and clay with lichen stood. There were small shoots of spruce and, uh, and birch poking through. My optimistic father spoke with awe and gratitude in his voice again. You know, I think the earth is pregnant with seed. So next, I began collecting seed from our own effusive perennial pollinator plants and offered them to friends and neighbors to spread the word. Next. Just some more growth down by our swamp, fall asters, goldenrod, sweet fern, and sumac. Next. Falls unabashed color. Next. Seed pods from the autumn moosewood and, and a scarlet viburnum. Next. A chance to rest under a large spruce at the edge of North Point, which is where we are landing now. North Point area. Here we go. Uh, thank you there. And next. Fred Beck wrote an article on the glacial moraines at Snow's Cove available from the Blue Hill Heritage Trust website. The boulders and debris moved and packed by the Laurentide glacial melt eons ago formed this kind of landscape feature. And you'll see here in back of North Point going down the large slope to the about 60 feet down, all of the embedded boulders. It's a beautiful place. Next. This is some of the things that grow back there. Next, of course, Three views of beautiful moss. Next, all sorts of strange fungi. And for lack of an ID, I'm going to just call this one. I couldn't ID it on, uh, on, uh, on, anyway. So I call it the, the corrugated black bowl fungus. Next, ferns, polypodium, rock polypody on our North Point wooded slope. It's great green feathery displays show year round. Next, this with bunchberry dogwood in with the rock fern forming a bouquet. Next, 
in snow, it's so resilient. Next, we're coming to the end. November's pond goldenrods and cattails stand all in a glow. Next, autumn farewell. And next, a fitting natural benediction. Thank you so much, Anne. That was wonderful. What a beautiful story of transformation that you shared with us just now of your property. That's really, really inspiring. <laughs> oh, I guess I have to get my if, if any of you have questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box or you can raise your virtual hand. I did see one question in the chat box, Anne, um, and it was about um, the Japanese willow tree, is there something contagious about it? Does it have some sort of fungus or disease that was passed on to the other plants you mentioned? Do you have any idea about that? I don't, but I've uh, asked others and it was mostly, we don't know, but don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, we've gotten a lot of really wonderful comments in the chat box thanking you and for your beautiful visuals and um, just for inspiring people to try some of these ideas out in their own yard. So that's really exciting to see that in the chat box. And I had a quick question. Um, in one of your slides, you mentioned um, that, that you used to give away seeds or you would, I don't know if you gave them away or sold them. Do you, do you still do that? I can do it. I can just, I have handfuls left over. I mean, I pick a few so that I can do my own plugs, but then there are so many and I shake them back to the meadow to just inspire the meadow for further things. And then there's still more left because I mean, there's an abundance. And so I uh, just put them in some bags and gave them to the neighbors. That's wonderful. <laughs> but sure, I can. that can be done, yeah. That would be so cool. We could talk yeah. sometime because I know sure. there are some organizations in town, including Blue Heritage Trust, that want to start or maybe have already started a, a seed library exchange. That's program. right. So maybe Excellent. we should talk. <laughs> we will. We will. Um, there's another question in the chat box. Do you have a local rose you could recommend? A local what? A rose. Local rose. <laughs> I can have one I don't recommend. <laughs> no, uh, I'm, we're not so into roses now. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, that, that totally makes sense. I think there's a, um, it sounds like it's not, it wouldn't be from around here. I think it's called the Virginia Rose. And I'm pretty sure they sell those at the uh, Native Gardens of Blue Hill plant sale. Well, then that's-, that's So good. that might be a good one. Yes, yeah. There are a lot of comments. I'm, I'm combing through and I'm mostly just seeing praise and comment. And I mean, people are really like excited about, you know, your storytelling and your imagery. Um, Lander, forgive me, I'm actually, I'm having trouble coming across a question. Do you have a couple queued up that you wanted to ask or? Um, so I just saw one in the chat box um, that asks, do you have any um, shrubs that love shade recommendations? Yeah, viburnums. Mm -hmm. Uh, what else do I have? You know, a lot of the rhododendrons are pretty happy with that and swallowtails like them. Um, we don't have that much shape. <laughs> uh, Viburnums are great. And the, yes. the, um, the high bush cranberry, I think oh, that's the high bush. viburnum, right? Yeah. Awesome. And Val did confirm in the chat box that um, the Virginia rose is native. So <laughs> you could go with that. The Virginia rose is the wrong. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Andrew, did we have any raised hands? Let me check. I know we're, we're a little, we're a little bit over, but I'm, in yeah, celebration we, we of Earth Day, I see no, no harm in. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's Let's, let's see, I think, let's see. Oh, I thought I saw one and then it disappeared. So maybe it, it might yeah, have it might been. been.
that that always happens once or twice normally. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, we did have a question at, at one point in the chat box during the presentation um, about being able to see this presentation again. And so I just wanna let people know that this is being recorded and we will send it out to everyone who is registered for this webinar. Um, and then it will also be on the Blue Heritage Trust website as well as the Island Heritage Trust website archives. So you can access it there too. Yeah. Thank you well, very much for having me here. I enjoyed it. And it was our pleasure. That was was so peaceful, and it, and I just loved how you navigated through like back and forth between all the seasons and similar landscapes, okay. and it was just really, it was beautiful storytelling with with imagery and your your knowledge of the plants in your yard and um, and what a spot. I mean, that is just like a little oasis down there on that on that point. Just superb. Oh, Jake, do you want to, me to show a picture of the book that people can have for free if they want to come by and get it? Yes, please, I would be happy. I would be happy for you to do that. And then we have a couple more questions in the chat box. This A Moment of Water book, um, can you see it? It's probably backwards. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have here, I gave them to IHT. Uh, if anyone would like to have it, it's the book that goes with that video that you saw in the first part. And if you'd like to have one, please, they're simply otherwise sitting in my attic. So take them. And the, the imagery in them is beautiful. Totally beautiful. Thank you so much, Anne. That's really sure. generous. Um, we have a couple more questions, which maybe we'll cover these in the chat box. And then, um, and then maybe we'll, we'll say goodnight and, and, and everyone can go and get their dinner. This has mm -hmm. been so wonderful. Um, Oh, there is a question actually, maybe you should answer first is how do we get the book? And did you mention that um, people could well, stop by your house or? No, uh, by, by Island Heritage Trust. I also could put them in Blue Hill Heritage Trust. Blue Hill Heritage Trust has some I gave to them and I don't know what they're doing with them. However, I have more and I can put them in both places. Uh, if people understand, they can go in there and just say, I want one. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so any Oh, I was just going to say anybody in the Deer Isle um, area who would like to stop by and pick one up can email me and set up a time and, and Lander maybe the same is true of, of Blue Hill. Yes, yeah. I know we have a couple right. left yeah, I'm leaving. and we can get more from Anne if people would like to stop by our office for those. Yeah, I probably have about a hundred so I think we can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, questions in the chat box. Um, for your natural beds, do you weed them or not? Do I do what? Do you weed the beds? Oh, weed them. Beds? Well, one of the advantages of putting plugs in is that they will grow a little faster and then you, are ha you have less problem with weeds. You're going to have that the first year or two. And after that, they would grow wide enough that they are pretty much taking up all the light. You know, so. But the first year or two is always work. Mm -hmm. Um, and then somebody says, do I understand correctly that the Ragosa Rose hosts the Japanese beetles and your lawn too? The lawn does, but you know, even though the, the Ragosa Rose stayed and kept growing until we could get at it uh, with an excavator soon, I hope, uh, it was reducing the lawn because the grubs live in the lawn the year before. Mm -hmm. And if you deprive them of lawn, they don't like meadows and things like that. They want lawn <laughs> and they don't have much lawn anymore. And we rarely see them, hmm. even though that Ragosa rose bush is there. I, bush, I mean, it's a hedge. <laughs> That's amazing. I did not know that about Japanese beetles. It's really oh, good yeah. to know. <laughs> <laughs> they have their ways. <laughs> so it looks like we have one more question if, if you're willing to take it, Anne. Sure. All right. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this, is a, this is a cute question. It's, he says, I don't want to bore all with a personal question about the dog Redora, but was she one of Farrell's pups? Yes, she was. <laughs> and, and she is also almost 14 years old and I believe she's the last remaining. There might be another one. Uh, and she's uh, on her way out. Uh, she is old and we know her time is coming, but uh, for right now we take care of her. And she takes care of us. 
Thank you so much, Anne, for joining us this evening. It's so wonderful to have you. Yes, thank you, Anne. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much for all you do. Yeah. And a happy Earth Day, everyone. Yes, happy Earth Day, everyone. Yeah. Have a great afternoon. evening. Thank you. Bye.